welcome. Welcome, everybody, to the IAPP Privacy Symposium Game Show. And in honor of this year's playoffs, it, we are modeling our game show after TSN's The Quiz. And so please put your hands together and welcome your host, James Duffy. James, where are you? James. Ah, oh, celebrities, they never show up when you want them to. Looks like I'm going to have to do this again myself. That was discouraging. <laughs> I'm sorry you don't get James Duthie. Um, welcome, everybody, to uh, the IAPP Canada Privacy Symposium. And uh, in honor of the playoffs, uh, we have our, a distinguished set of panelists uh, ready to explore and uh, break down the game for you uh, this afternoon. Um, and without any further ado, I'd like to introduce your panelists. Um, first, we have the captain and statesman, the Daniel Alfredson of the privacy world, Jennifer Stoddart. Welcome, Jennifer. Thank you. Next. I just want you to make sure that you know which senator I am, not one who's revising <laughs> his or her expense account, but <laughs> the... The Daniel Alfredson. <laughs> Next, our panelists, the distinguished, the effective, the enforcer. Dr. Ann Kavukian. <laughs> Welcome, Commissioner Kavukian. Thank you. Uh, and uh, next, we have the hot new young rookie, the nail Yakupov of the privacy world, <laughs> Commissioner Jill Clayton. It's, it's a lot of space in this jersey. <laughs> nice dress. <laughs> it's signed. <laughs> And lastly, but not least, we have the ultimate defender of the privacy world, the ever so stylish Commissioner Liz Denham. Well, welcome everybody and thank you very much for participating. Um, we're, we're here to uh, have a little bit of fun, uh, but also so talk some privacy. Uh, so put on your uh, privacy analyst hats and uh, let's get this uh, game show going. So quiz question number one. Recently, there was news about an international privacy sweep. And um, Commissioner Stoddart, uh, this refers to Hmm, a gigantic broom used to push underwear under the bed when guests arrive unexpectedly. <laughs> and I'm not talking about my Superman underwear. <laughs> uh, the Publishers Clearinghouse Lottery and a big, big win every time in Euros. Or is it various countries working together to examine data handling practices? Well, you know, um, I want to give an answer that gives true weight to the importance of, of you know, these various possibilities in my life. So I'd have to say number A has really been <laughs> figuring largely in my personal life. As some of you know who've ever come to 
uh, my condo. One of its uh, salient <laughs> features are piles of dust bunnies in the corner. And so the privacy sweep is really the best thing uh, that I have found after the invention of the vacuum cleaner in my, in my <laughs> life. When I battle through the dust bunnies, get out the door, get to the office, then I have to deal with the other privacy sweep, uh, which is actually a lot cooler. Um, it was headed up, it was the idea of Brant Homan. Where are you, Brant Homan? Brant is over there. Okay. Big round of applause for Brant Homan, please. major player on the SENS team in Ottawa. Brent brought this wonderful idea from the Competition Bureau. He um, encouraged and won 19 jurisdictions, including our own BC, to join uh, an examination of online privacy policies during the same week. And uh, we did it all together. We're discussing the results when you hear more about it this summer. So that's that's the second less important privacy suite. Very good. Liz, did you want to add anything? Our office looked at, I think, 250 websites in BC. Our sweep included not-for-profit organizations and political parties that are uniquely subject to the BC law. And we found that only 49% of these BC businesses had privacy policies. So we're frowning down on that. Um, and we, the results will come out with the commissioners, with the federal commissioners and, and the other participants. Only 49%. 49%. And we've had the laws in force for how many years now? <laughs> okay, uh, quiz question uh, number two. Drones are Bill Kessel, Dion Phaneuf, and any other member of the Maple Leafs. This is brave, eh, for an Ottawa, <laughs> a, an Ottawa fan to come into Toronto and, yeah. A topic that the awesome privacy scan just wrote about, that's a, shelf, a shameless self-promotion, sorry about that. Don't know how I threw that in. Uh, a technology that poses some serious privacy questions and issues. Dr. Kabukian, do you want to uh, tackle that question? You need the mic. I'm going to say none of the above. In, I'm going to say none of the above. <laughs> um, although I would probably lean towards C. Uh, drones are an amazing new technology that uh, for uh, proper purposes will have amazing uh, results for search and rescue missions and th there's so many uses. They've been used in Ontario by the OPP and Houghton Region Police for completely unrelated to surveillance activities such as search and rescue and going into remote areas. But the, the threat, of course, arises when they are used in a covert manner to engage in public surveillance, domestic surveillance. Completely unacceptable. And the good news is, in the states, 32 states have already either introduced or in the process of introducing uh, bills to prohibit the use of drones for purposes of domestic surveillance without a, a warrant. Th this is awesome. It's already happening it, very proactively for once, which is out, outstanding. And in Canada, uh, we, I seem to have less concern, certainly in Ontario, the police forces we've spoken to um, are not even contemplating the use of drones for purposes of uh, surveillance. So we have to remain ever vigilant because this is one technology that if you take your eye off the ball, it will just leap ahead and we won't be able to pull it back. It's an ideal application of privacy by design. And we're working on this actively now. We've got a paper coming out uh, actually next week, the week after next, June the 4th, called Surveillance Then and Now. And it's an examination of surveillance starting with the olden days cameras, which used to be a thing of the past, and going through uh, GPS, um, automatic license, uh, uh, ALRP recognition and uh, ending with drones. So we're taking a sweeping look at surveillance potential. And the only thing I want to leave with you is we have to find ways to come in front of technologies that will engage in surveillance, especially 
in a covert manner where you're given no notice. And the, the example that comes to mind, which you're going to think is not surveillance related and it's not technically, is Google Glass. When you think of Google Glass, it's someone wearing glasses that has the capacity to take your picture, perhaps videotape, without your knowledge or consent. To that I say, what I want to see, and I want any techies out there to give me this, I want a technology that would enable me to put on the equivalent of privacy glasses that would, in effect, block the transmission or the interception by Google Glass or any other wearable device of my facial image. And think of Star Trek, think of force fields. That's what I want to develop so that people have a response to this and be able to say no because they're not going to know who's doing it where. So we need to respond to technology with technology. We need to get smart about this. Excellent. Yes. Commissioner Stoddard. Yeah, can I just point out that I think the real answer uh, is not among those three. The drones are, is a term used when somebody goes on for too long. <laughs> like a privacy commissioner. <laughs> The gloves are off. <laughs> collecting and using big, I'm moving right along here. Um, co collecting and using big data is like a Big Mac, hard to digest. Uh, it's an American sitcom. Um, oh, no, sorry. Is that the Big Bang Theory? Yeah. Or an invaluable for research, but a potential threat to privacy if not handled properly. Commissioner Clayton. Hmm. <laughs> it could be any of those. <laughs> um, like a big map, hard to digest. That's kind of the same as C. Invaluable for research, but a potential threat. Hmm. Um, I actually, I think that... Um, well, big data is a very, very hot topic at this privacy conference. There's been a lot of sessions where, um, you know, some, some real... Uh, experts in the field, some people who are spending a, a lot of time looking at big data have um, been here to talk to you and, and raise some of those issues. I'm not going to go into all of the issues, um, but I will point out a couple that, um, that, that you know, they're, they're the flags, they're the things that, um, not to overuse the phrase, I've already used it a couple times today, but the things that keep us up at night. Um, the potential for big data is obviously vast, enormous, and you know, I'm, I'm certainly one of those people who believes in the value of information. Just ask anybody that I work for. I'm looking for stats all the time. I'm trying to get some information so that I can make decisions, so I, I get how important that is. But, um, but it has to be done properly. Um, you know, we've heard a lot at this conference also about the accountability framework. You know, if you're moving in that direction, the drones, big data, social media, cloud computing, all of these things. It's not, it's not the technology that we should necessarily be afraid of. It's, it's making sure that it's done properly with due regard to, to privacy. And the accountability framework is one way of doing that. I'm less concerned about some of these, um, these new technologies if the proper foundation is in place, if we know that organizations have um, you know, the policies and the procedures, but not just those things, that they're checking and rechecking and evergreening their, their um, uh, programs. If that foundation, if the framework is in place, then I think there's room to go um, in some of these directions. So collecting using big data, I'm, I'm going to go with C. So yes, invaluable for research, but a potential threat if not handled properly. You have to set it up right to begin with. Excellent. Thank you. Any other comments on that? No? I was going to say that I think uh, the challenges of, of big data are absolutely here. Um, what I hear about in the healthcare sector is that especially with the Canadian publicly paid system, we're all sitting on this incredible treasure trove of data and if we don't mine it and use it properly, then babies will die. Mm. So we get into this, this really challenging dialogue with with researchers, with academics, that want to actually use this incredibly important information, pharmaceutical data, to come up with new solutions that will allow us to live longer. The challenge is, um, how do we actually, how do, how do we do that while still allow 
the principles of privacy to be applied. And I'm out there saying all the time that research and privacy are friends, not foes. But where I really see it in British Columbia, where I see this dialogue about big data, is in healthcare. Mm -hmm. Yes, go ahead, Anne. And if I could just uh, agree completely with what Liz and Jill have said and just add one thing, the key to big data is de-identify. If you lead with de-identifying, especially health-related data, you can maximize the benefits of the data for full health research purposes and protect privacy completely, securely, strongly. There are excellent de-identification tools out there. Everyone knows of Khaled el -Imam and his outstanding de-identification tools. And I applaud Alberta that have used his tools uh, on their entire health database and are getting the, the multiple benefits. Excellent, excellent. Um, having, uh, speaking about health data, all right, having uh, true control over your personal health information is a myth, true or false. True, the healthcare sector simply cannot be trusted or false. Our laws provide adequate protections and they strike the right balance. Or you can go off the map here and say none of the above. <laughs> not true, not false. Who wants to tackle that question? Well, I'll follow. Sure. Um, I actually, I actually, I'm going to dodge that entirely. If okay. I can do that, right? I'm Lundquist. I'm the star goalie. Um, I actually think that we've got a lot more challenges than whether or not we absolutely have control over our health data. I think that the current paradigm of personal information protection and standalone health information is broken. Just going to put that out there. I think that um, we're really going to have to examine our health information legislation to deal with IT challenges of, of EHRs, to deal with tissue banks and genomics to be able to deal with the fact that individuals are more, more often than not now custodians of their own health information. So I think all of these issues will shift. And I don't think that even the newest standalone health information legislation is adapting or can actually deal with this new environment. Bigger challenges to come. So you want to see more legislation? No, I want to see more flexibility in the legislation, and I, I really don't think that the challenges right in front of us are dealt with adequately in our legislative framework that we have now. Dr. Kabukian, do you have? And, and I think this is one area where, in addition to legislation and, and new frameworks, processes, and how to protect the data, we're going to look for new ways to protect data. How can we get smart about the use of data, and would it be possible to enable the data to protect themselves, could we add some artificial agents to the data that render the data, in effect, self-protective? And I know it's a far out context. We're doing this at U of T. I chair something called the Identity Privacy and Security Institute, and we're introducing something called Smart Data. Smart Data, if, if you look at our website, you can learn more about it. It's all about uh, arming the data in a way that enables greater control by the data subject and proper contextual use, which can only come from the data subject. It's looking to the future, because in the future, we're going to have to have greater intelligence, not only in terms of our processes and legislative frameworks, but arming the data itself to protect itself and finding ways to instill greater control on the part of patients and data subjects. Yeah, go ahead. Can I, can I speak out of turn? Um, I just wanted to follow up on, on this question. It's, it's of interest to me. Um, and I'm, I'm, I agree with what you said. I do think that, um, that the legislative framework is not ideal. But I do want to speak up um, for our uh, standalone health law in Alberta, because I think there are some, some, some interesting things in that legislation that, um, that actually, frankly, might work in the private sector or the public sector. I mean, there's, there's nothing, nothing is ever perfect. but. Um, you know, this, this idea of having true control and laws providing adequate protections. In Alberta, um, basically information is shared among um, health care providers so that, you know, if I live in Edmonton now, City of Champions, by the way, City of Champions. Really? <laughs> really? That, that team okay, was the right to be forgotten. <laughs> <laughs> How do you know Vancouver isn't in the playoffs this year? Hasn't been a riot. Oh, and no riots in BC. <laughs> and 
and the Toronto Maple Leafs. Don't even say Losers <laughs> by design. Oh, dear. <laughs> oh, my goodness. Oh, my goodness. I'm below the belt. Ref? Ref? What, <laughs> what are you doing here? I think somebody goes to the penalty. It was just, getting, just because I'm getting wearing, too serious. Somebody. He was just, getting too serious. Uh, uh, Losers uh, by two design. Two minutes. I, I am not calling any penalties. <laughs> No. No penalties? No penalties. Do you have All a right. whistle? I, uh, you need a whistle. I do need a whistle. Yeah. <laughs> um, yes, I was saying so. I was talking about the health law in, Al in Alberta because... <laughs> you were talking about what? The health law in Alberta. Oh, yeah. That's right. Health law in Alberta. <laughs> So there's this idea that if I'm, if I'm living in Edmonton, City of Champions, and I'm injured in Lethbridge, for example, that my healthcare provider, the healthcare provider who is treating me will have access to my information. This is, this is a very good thing. Um, and information in that circle is shared, for the most part, without consent. But it's balanced by all sorts of controls, including um, controls that patients are able to exercise. We spent a lot of time last year, and we're still promoting this, um, working on a document that we published, which is a patient rights document, because we've had the health legislation for you know, over 10 years now. And, um, you know, there are some, the ability for patients to, um, you know, the, a, a healthcare treatment provider is required by law to consider a patient's express wishes if they don't want their information to go to a particular health care provider. Um, the legislation includes a, a legal requirement to, um, to record disclosures of information. So it, it might be being shared without consent, but you have to keep a record of that. It's explicit in the legislation that a patient can go and get a copy of the audit log. And Patients don't know these things, that they have those controls, that it's set out explicitly in legislation. So again, I'm not saying that it's a perfect piece of legislation, but, um, but there are some of those, those rights and, and controls, individual controls that can be exercised. We've been doing our bit to, um, to, to make that information available to individuals because there hasn't, that's never really happened um, in Alberta. And I think it's resulting in some extra work for some of the, you know, the health region and, and um, uh, the ministry. But um, I think it's really important. You, you can build those controls into legislation to make it stronger, even if you have laws that are allowing for some of this information sharing. But I think with new technology and with um, data analy analytics applied to healthcare, then those, what used to be discrete um, uses, whether it's patient mm -hmm. care, quality assurance, system management and research are becoming increasingly blurred. So I do think that, that our approach is really needs a new, a new more look. flexible framework, a new look at it. How we're going to deal with genomics, I don't know with mm -hmm. this kind of framework. So I think, you know, maybe there, there needs to be more flexibility around, around policy in this area. Well, and I think one of the other issues is around transparency. I won't go on about this, but um, speaking about big data and, and the information that's in, the, say, an electronic health record, one of the things about the electronic health record is nobody has any idea what the heck mm -hmm. is going on in it, what information is in there, how it's being used, what those secondary uses are. So in some ways, I think, you know, the focus needs to be on transparency for some of these initiatives and making it clear to individuals so they can exercise their rights and they can take control. Uh, my office would kill me if I didn't mention PHIPAA, so I must tell you about Ontario's Personal Health Information Protection Act, which I would suggest is the world's best health information privacy law. <laughs> but don't take my word for it. The Institute of Medicine two years ago in the U.S. studied health information privacy laws all around the world because they wanted to use one as a framework to base their revisions on the U.S. HIPAA. The only existing statute they pointed to for that would serve as a model for such revisions was Ontario's PHIPAA. And it is very similar in terms of the concept of the circle of care, which assumes the, um, the patient's implied consent for use within their healthcare providers. So if my, if my GP uh, refers me to a specialist who sends me to a lab for testing, they can assume my implied consent for all those purposes, which are for the purpose of my healthcare. But an individual can say no if they don't want their information shared. It is a wonderful model. It enables access to information when it's needed. And then if you're contemplating sending the information out to a third party outside of the circle of care, the walls go up. Positive consent is required on the part of the patient, the data subject, before that happens. It's been working 
fabulously. Here in Ontario, since 2004, we oversee compliance with the legislation, which applies to both public and private sector agencies, and it is an outstanding statute. We have a lot of information, a lot of uh, guidance documents on our website if you want to take a look. Commissioner Stoddard, did you have anything? Well, um, being a European, I thought you'd like to know what's, um, what's <laughs> happening in Europe, and I was lucky to uh, be invited to an international genomic um, research conference um, in Europe a couple of weeks ago. And doing the background reading for that and preparing my remarks with um, some of my staff, I came to the position, you can, I think this is posted on our website now, now that in the area of medical research, given the particular context, given the strong ethical framework, given the professionalization of the people involved, given the public cost, this is not exactly what I said there, but um, uh, given the importance of the public interest involved, um, that consent may not be the centerpiece of how we deal with people's information. I think that we should, as we go forward, say this is an area where it's not practicable if you're doing genetic research, genomic research, and you're mixing things up and you have to get samples. Apparently, according to these, these are internationally known genetic research experts from thousands and ten thousands of people in cohorts in order to validate, for example, rare diseases and so on. So I came to the opinion that in that context, I thought we could dispense with consent. Of course, things are de-anonymized and so on. Remains the ethical issue, of course, if you discover some medical situation over which um, a person would have control if they were informed, then my opinion would be you should go back, try and identify them and try and warn them because they can do something. Mm. Um, so that's, that was kind of, for me, a glimpse into the future. Yeah. But increasingly, we, our community has to be involved in these policy discussions, deeply involved. And I think Canadians expect their information to be used for public interest medical research. So we better not have these conversations that are going like that. We have to be at the table. Yeah. Excellent. Yeah. But, sorry, but on that, and, and um, there was a very interesting uh, workshop here on the European regulation. This group of researchers are very concerned because the latest comments, that's the Albrecht report on the European regulation, does not allow scientific research to be one of the uh, exceptions to the consent model. So of course the medical community is in overdrive and I must say I sympathize with them. But we know the European regulation is far from being adopted at the present time, but right. that is a concern in, in my opinion because I agree with the player at the end of the line. <laughs> yes! <laughs> that it is a public interest issue. We all have an interest in finding the best way to deal with our health issues. Okay, excellent. So for a true and false question, that generated a lot of discussion. <laughs> <laughs> I thought they were just gonna flip a coin. Um, next question. A comprehensive privacy program is a really, 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 <laughs> really big one. Uh, it's a rarity, sort of like winning all four series in the playoffs. Or it's an essential way for an organi organization to try to comply with the law. Commissioner Stoddard? Um, <laughs> well, I don't know. Some people would say it's a really, really big one and it's really expensive and that's why they don't invest in them. <laughs> that's what I was talking about yesterday. Um, and so it is kind of a rarity too. Um, but if you look at it more positively, it could be C. And in fact, myself and Liz's office and Jill's office mm -hmm. um, have all produced a document about how to set up um, a comprehensive privacy program. And so I hope people are, you know, reading this and taking it to heart. And again, you know, I. I think this is so important that it, we have to have some way um, to check up on it. And so I come back to how do you demonstrate accountability? You demonstrate it because you've got a pri comprehensive privacy program. But I didn't work on this nearly as much as Liz Denham did, so she's probably got more thoughts on it. 
I think my staff are getting tired of me talking about the accountability paper. So just to really, really bug them, <laughs> I decided that we had to write another paper, <laughs> another paper about accountability in the public sector, which our office is, is going to be releasing in the, in the coming weeks. But in all seriousness, um, I do think that the establishment of comprehensive, full-sum privacy management programs are a, a, a way through of the mire that we see right now. So I don't see how any organization, unless you're the corner dry cleaner, can do 21st century information processing using personal information. So we're talking about global data flows, we're talking about big data, which is just data analytics on steroids. We're talking about the application of new technology. You can't do that work without having the management processes in place across your organization. And increasingly, you'll see that the commissioners will be using this privacy management framework in our enforcement work. And the work that you do with your programs will have evidentiary value in investigations and audits. Boy, that was a really serious answer. That was very serious. <laughs> <laughs> it's okay. Next question. Privacy by design. Guess who's this, this one is directed to? <laughs> <laughs> Privacy by design is a great concept, but putting it in practice is... Well, it's, it, it is just like that new awesome sense jersey. It hides figures. Yes. Uh, putting it into practice is virtually impossible, unless, of course, you have Commissioner Kavukian as your spokesperson. <laughs> or it's not as difficult as you might think and totally worth it. <laughs> and. <laughs> All of the above. This one's easy. Uh, of course, we've been pushing this uh, for many years now, but. The, the, the beautiful uh, vision that I have, that I had, is, is coming into fruition. So Privacy by Design has now been translated into 31 languages all around the world. Think of a major language, it appears in that language. And we didn't, we didn't pay for any of that, we just reached out, I would reach out to my colleagues in different jurisdictions, and they, at their own behest, are translating this and adopting it. I can give you examples from all around the world. We get contacted all the time. Japan has an active movement. Singapore just contacted us. There's, there's so much all around the world. Of course, the EU, it's in their regulation. Um, in the FTC, Privacy by Design is the first of three recommended best practices for privacy. So what's the big deal? Why is it taken off? Why was it made the international framework for protecting privacy in 2010 that was unanimously passed by privacy pr commissioners and data protection authorities. The reason is we as commissioners do a very strong job. I think we do a very good job. We really take our work seriously. But increasingly, the majority of privacy infractions don't even come to the surface. If you think of the tip of the iceberg, if we get the tip of the iceberg, we're lucky. Because with the growth of ubiquitous computing, Wi-Fi positioning systems, online social connectivity, data everywhere, it is simply impossible to address all the infractions that are arising. And so the privacy by design model is proactive instead of offering reactive regulatory compliance after the fact to offer systems of redress, we're trying to also prevent the harms from arising. You think of a preventative medical model, much better to detect the cancer and prevent it rather than allow it to arise and offer chemo afterwards. So we're trying to prevent it. And it's not a concept anymore. I can point you to, we have a paper we did um, in December called Operationalizing Privacy by Design. In it, we reference nine different areas in which it's on the ground working, ranging from all the things you might think of, CCTV cameras, biometrics, sensors, you name it, this can be embedded in technology, biometrics, in a way that on a go-forward basis, you can prevent the harm from arising. And I called last year the year of the engineer. I went around the world trying to talk to engineers to get their input, how doable is this? Every single person I spoke to said, of course we can do it. If we get those instructions at the time we're designing the technology or the business practice or informational process. If you address it at the outset, 
you can embed it into the data architecture, into the processes, you can make it a reality and minimize not only your the privacy harms, but the cost to your organization by avoiding the data breaches, avoiding the harm to your brand and to your reputation. You can do all of this at a fraction of the cost by embedding it at the outset into the process. And so it, I'm glad to say it is in fact a reality. It's operating all around the world. And if you go to our privacybydesign.ca website, you'll find countless of examples of how it's working on the ground right now. And, and just, just to build, because we've been talking a lot this, these past couple days about um, reform to our laws, particularly our reform in Canada, and the need for it. And w we are starting to see privacy by design being incorporated into legal requirements in other jurisdictions. I think I know the answer, but would you like to see PBD incorporated into our laws? Like made a spe as a specific requirement in our privacy laws? I, I would love that. And we wrote a paper two years ago, Privacy by Design and Law. And uh, we had a foreword from um, the Honorable uh, Pamela, who is here, Jones Harbor. I, I don't know where she is, but she wrote a, a wonderful foreword in how they were contemplating doing this at the FTC in the mm -hmm. United States, the Federal Trade Commission. We have in Ontario a Privacy by Design uh, Center of Excellence that the Ontario public sector has just put up now. So it is inching its way into government organizations if we could find a way to introduce it in legislation. And the way you would do that is you're not going to tell people what to do. You're just going to plant the notion of proactively embedding some privacy protective features at the outset of programs and initiatives and technologies. And if you could plant that seed, then maybe it would grow and would, I was going to say minimize our work. It's not going to minimize our work because there's th that work is growing, even the tip of the iceberg. But it would be amazing because it would minimize the harms. I've seen that again and again. So hopefully, take a look at the OPS, the Center of Excellence for Privacy by Design. It was just initiated about six months ago, and it's really growing. Thank you. Liz, no? I think the, the point is if you're going to adopt shiny new toys and you know new ways of crunching data, then you have to have privacy by design. And privacy by design is part of a comprehensive, accountable organization. I'll keep saying those words over and over again. So do you think it already it, exists? It does. I mean, there are pathfinder companies. There are pathfinder organizations, I think, particularly in financial services. Um, certainly in some of the telecoms, um, obviously the health sector, you can see some real leaders in this work, but we need to go further. And you know what I've been talking about now is the public sector, because arguably they should be held to a higher standard mm -hmm. than the private sector because the state can compel our information. And let's face it, Facebook doesn't knock on our door at three o'clock in the morning. So I think the public sector needs to step up and do a much better job of privacy by design of accountable, full sum privacy management programs. So that's where I'm going next. Any BC public bodies here? <laughs> <laughs> She's on the warpath. <laughs> next question. Uh, Pre-employment criminal background checks are, they're no longer necessary because we have Facebook. <laughs> They're a handy tool for next year's hockey draft picks. Uh, they're an invasive screening technique that should only be used in limited circumstances. Commissioner Clayton, you want to tackle that one? Hmm. I'm, I think the answer is C, but I think there are an awful lot of organizations that think the answer is A. Um, unfortunately. Um, Alberta actually doesn't have a, a great rep for um, uh, criminal background checks. I think there was a, a report, was it last year, the Canadian Civil Liberties did a, a study of criminal, that was criminal police, information, checks, police checks. information checks, yeah. Um, and Alberta did not come out very well in that, uh, in that study. And I think that um, part of the problem is that there's a, there's there are no standards in Alberta at the moment um, for criminal background checks and, and what an organization, say an employer, might be asking for um, on the one hand and what they actually need are, are also two very, very different things. So, um, you know, I do know that there's a, there's a group that's gotten together in Alberta that's actually taking a look at 
uh, at criminal background checks and what information is collected and what information is being shared. And I know that you know Liz will have something to say about this because she's done a, um, an interesting report um, on the topic. I think it, all I'm going to say is that we haven't looked at it um, very deeply in Alberta. We get occasional uh, complaints, and we've been very we've been reactive to that. But we are involved with this group right now that's trying to um, proactively figure out how to solve some of the problems. Um, when too much information is being shared, and organizations are collecting this information with a gap without first turning their mind to, do I actually need this information? And of course, once you get this information, that it, that brings on a whole other set of responsibilities. What are you going to do with it? And how are you going to limit access to it? And how long are you going to keep it? Because it's a snapshot in time. And what if you ask for this information, you find out something um, that raises flags for you. Um, is a DUI a problem? Is a uh, break and enter? And, like, you know, and it, it raises problem? all sorts of issues. It's, it's a far more complicated thing than just we're going to, uh, as a blanket program, do criminal background checks on everybody. Um, yeah, so it's tricky, and I know we'll, you'll have some comments on this. Well, we, our office did an audit of the BC provincial government's criminal records check policy, and um, we found that there, there has to be a nexus between the requirements of the job and what kind of background check you're doing. So whether it's a criminal background check or other types of checks. So, I mean, that's the principle. The BC government was not only um, doing a criminal records check on everybody, but also doing a recheck every five years and every time somebody changed jobs. So our report came out and um, we had eight recommendations. The provincial government backed off on their recheck policy. They backed off and defined more clearly the types and classifications of jobs for which there should be a criminal records check. That was one thing. My, I have, what is keeping me up at night mm -hmm. are police information checks. So criminal records checks are a check for outstanding charges and convictions. Police information checks is a broader review of all kinds of information that's in a police database collected for law enforcement, and again, revealing all kinds of negative police contact, complaints about the neighbor, um, investigations that have not resulted in a charge, and I think that information may be valid for law enforcement. It's not valid in the context of employment. And last time I checked in Canada, there was a presumption of innocence. And so I'm much more concerned about the practice of police information checks. Michael McAvoy and I have been having long discussions with both the police services and employer groups in, in BC. We're not moving very quickly on this, so my next step is an enforcement action. Mm -hmm. Commissioner Stoddard. Yeah, uh, Liz has uh, touched something that's really, really concerning to us in the federal jurisdiction. That is the broadening of the information that um, some would like to be available, not only to employers for background checks, but also to law enforcement. And it goes far beyond, and, and the, the infrastructure is being set up now far beyond do you have a conviction, but were you merely under investigation? What, everything, what did you do? Um, in today's uh, privacy news, we see that uh, some would like to take uh, DNA samples from people who are mere suspects. Uh, and so this constant, constant broadening of the circle of information of anybody who could be rightly or wrongly nearly or, or more distantly connected with a possible criminal is certainly of great concern. It's just concerning, absolutely. Okay. Um, public opinion surveys about privacy reveal, well, heck, whatever you want them to say, <laughs> privacy is dead. Um, or that everybody has a crush on Sidney Crosby, even me, although not, not right now. <laughs> I, I'm, suspend, I'm suspending my crush on Sidney Crosby. Uh, that indiv individuals still care deeply about their privacy. Commissioner Stoddard. Well, um, I certainly don't have a crush on Sidney Crosby <laughs> because I'm going to beat him tonight. Yes. <laughs> so. <laughs> 
And as for privacy being dead, the only people who ever said that had a vested monetary interest in killing it. Hmm. So that leaves us with C. Um, let's see what some of our polling can say about that. Um, in fact, it tends to contradict that statement quite radically. I mean, when we poll Canadians, and I want to give this to you accurately, so I'm going to read from a press release. Many Canadians reported being very concerned about posting information about their location and their contact information. The majority have said that they decided not to install or to have uninstalled an app because of the amount of personal information they would have to provide. And over two-thirds of Canadians say they have chosen not to use a site or a service because they were uncomfortable with the terms of the privacy policy. And as I explained to those of you who were um, in the audience yesterday, that's probably an underestimation. So privacy is far from dead for Canadians. It's a real concern. Um, folks who use mobile apps are a little more savvy. I would say that's um, uh, about what they do to protect themselves. That's all good. But um, some other statistics that should give us all pause to reflect on the importance of this value. 71%, that's almost three Canadians out of four, think protecting the personal information of Canadians will be one of the most important issues facing our country in the next 10 years. Only one in five think the federal government takes its responsibility to protect personal information seriously, and only 13% feel that businesses are serious about their privacy responsibility. And I don't know how many of you have heard about uh, notification fatigue. I, I, this is often brought up. Oh, even if we had data breach protection, people don't want to be notified in notification fatigue. They just throw all these things in the garbage and so on. Well, we've never really had it except in Alberta, so we don't know that much about it. But 97%, 97%, that's almost all of the Canadians polled want to be notified by an organization if their personal information was compromised. So, you know, I think privacy is certainly alive and well, and this is, I'd say, a growing concern among Canadians. Excellent, excellent, thank you very much. Um, speaking about mandatory breach notification, <laughs> it is, a total pain <laughs> in the you-know-what, only followed by those who are worried about media attention or critical as a means of demonstrating accountability and openness. And as the commissioner with the jurisdiction, um, uh, in, in Alberta you have mandatory breach notification, so maybe you can tackle this question, Jill. Um, well, we have, we have mandatory breach reporting to my office, and then I have the ability to requ require organizations to notify individuals who have been, um, uh, who are at risk of significant harm as a result of that breach. I do just want to follow up something that Commissioner Stoddard said there about notification fatigue, because I remember before Alberta's law came in, and you hear that all the time, you know, this is the problem with mandatory breach. I have never, ever, ever had anybody come up to me and say, you know, I got so many <laughs> notifications of privacy breaches, I'm really tired of getting these things. <laughs> Has anybody ever said anything like that? I, I don't think that's a, a real um, issue. Um, so mandatory breach notification is a total pain in the you-know-what. Um, sometimes, yeah, we, <laughs> we get a lot of these things, and I know it's a lot of... Um, it's a lot of work for staff when a whole bunch of these things come in at, the, at, a, um, at any given time all at once. Um, I was saying in the session earlier today that we get about 10 of them a month um, on average, but it doesn't actually work out to 10 a month. They don't come in space like that. It's a good that. thing you're giving us some stats because the Oilers haven't generated very much of those. Tell lately. Michael to stop emailing <laughs> you. Put your Blackberry away. <laughs> 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 don't think I don't know what's going on here. <laughs> and I like stats. Everybody knows I like stats. Yes, I know you do. <laughs> so it can be a total pain in the you-know-what, but um, ultimately, and to some extent, it is mandatory breach notification is about um, those who are worried about media attention, but, you know, we used to get self-reported breaches voluntarily all the time before there was a mandatory uh, requirement in the legislation to report these things to us, and that's because organizations want us to know ahead of time, because 
somebody's going to find out, the media is going to be all on it, um, and, and they'll come to us and they'll say, what do you know about this thing? And so organizations have always reported, uh, well, not all, all breaches, but they have reported to us because they want us to know and they want to uh, get some advice and guidance on dealing with the issue and, and they want to be able to, to respond to the media for sure. And I'm okay with that. Um, but I do think that, uh, that breach reporting to us and certainly notifying individuals when individuals are at risk of harm uh, from a breach is absolutely critical and part of demonstrating accountability and openness and frankly just respect for your customers and your clients. I mean the point of notification is that individuals will uh, be able to take steps to protect themselves and um, this is part of control. We've already spoken about control. It's about openness. It's about transparency. It's all of those things. Um, it, it's just the right thing to do in, in many cases. So. Um, I think our experience with, with breach notification has been really positive. I was saying again today that you know we're still learning. We're, we're, we've just passed the three-year mark um, having mandatory reporting to my office. What I think is really encouraging is that um, you know these reports do come to the office and in an extremely high percentage of cases, it's something like 80% of the time, the notification's already happened. So you only have to report to us if it's a real risk of significant harm. Um, if you've decided there's a real risk of significant harm and you need to report to me, then chances are you're, you've already talked to the individuals. People are sending out notifications. And I think one of the, the good things in the legislation also is that it's fairly prescriptive in terms of what needs to be in a report to me, but it's also prescriptive in terms of what needs to go in the notification statement. At a bare minimum, you have to tell people certain things, give them information about the incident and what you're doing to, to fix it. So um, there's room for improvement. I mean, who knows what the next round will look like. Um, we'll probably have some suggestions. It, it's still early days as we work through it, but I think it's generally been a very positive thing. We're getting a lot more, uh, we're, we have information, we have knowledge and, um, and data and trends and, and uh, real life cases we can go back to that we can turn into um, outreach efforts and guidance documents to help organizations to deal with these things and respond when, uh, and hopefully avoid some of these breaches. Chris, we yep. also have mandatory breach notification in Ontario uh, under PHIPA. Uh, we've had it um, since 2004, so we're approaching 10 years. Very, very successful. But what's interesting, especially when you're dealing with patients, uh, we've worked, we always work with the healthcare custodians to develop something that is not a one-size-fits-all. When you're talking about patients and they just get a cold call letter in the mail notifying them of, of a breach relating to their personal health information, it's very, very stressful. Last thing you want to do is add to the stress of patients going through um, a healthcare crisis. So we often work with physicians, for example, if they're going to have some of those patients involved or repeat patients that they see on a weekly basis, for example, then we draft a script with them that they can give verbally to the patient when they come in at their next visit. And that is much less stressful, for example, than cold call letter you get in the mail and you don't know what to make of it in terms of the, how, how harmful is this. So many ways to do it. It's an invaluable tool and uh, it can be done very creatively at times. <laughs> the question we've all been waiting for. Which team will win the Stanley Cup? The Toronto Blue Jays? <laughs> <laughs> Who cares? We all have privacy issues. <laughs> <laughs> or go Sands go. <laughs> we can believe in the miracle. <laughs> Um, seriously, um, again, uh, we come to the end of our game show, and um, and I'm just personally, uh, again, taken aback at your willingness to participate and your willingness to have fun with us every year at the symposium, and it goes a long way. And I know that we all really appreciate the fact that you guys take your time out of your busy schedules to, to do this with us. And uh, I just wanted to say I'm re really appreciative. Thank you very much. I know uh, everybody, we paused for lunch. You actually do have dessert coming up. Uh, and I understand it's a yummy one, so you might want to stick around for that. And there's still a few sessions left. There's some sessions that start at 2 o'clock, so if you want to... Uh, if you want to join those sessions, you're more than welcome to. For everybody who's going to be taking an exam later on today, good luck. Last minute cramming is always good, but make sure you have it after dessert. 
And uh, just really quickly, um, I, I, I do want to say uh, a personal thanks uh, uh, from, from me, but also uh, I think we're all thankful for the IAPP staff who put on an absolutely wonderful uh, conference for us these past few days. Um, all the people out over at the registration desk and the women wearing the, 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 the beautiful scarves, um, I'm very appreciative of all their hard work and uh, I'm sure you guys are too, so thank you very much.